markets by contributing to the John Lothian News GoFundMe campaign to support the Markets Wiki education history focused video series and more. Phenomenal. As I used to say, it was like Jed Clampett shooting at the ground and hitting oil. You know, it was just, it was a booming business. I, I mean, you know, I just finished re reading Leo Muhammad's newest book, the memoir is basically about the financial futures. Leo and I are very, very good. I mean, I still go to dinner with him and his wife, my wife and I, several times a year. So I, I read the book, he sent me a copy and, and I read it and uh, I was glad he took the high road and didn't I, I was really glad about that. It's really rises above whatever animosities you might have or disappointments. And he didn't take a, and so for that opportunity, as, as I used to laugh with him, I, even back in the seventies, I said, you're, you're making more millionaires than, uh, than uh, Steinbrenner, which was true, you know, because the exchange was growing by leaps and bounds and all there was was opportunity. And, and I come from a, a, a very middle class background, and you work hard. You, and if you if you were willing to avail yourself, there was nothing but opportunities. Eighty two, I still thought the dollar uh, was going to go lower, and I kept. I, and that was a real lesson to me because hey, and as I, I did a Tribune interview um, at the back of the Tribune magazine on Sunday, I think my turn, and in uh, May of May of nineteen eighty seven, I sat down with them. And they asked and they did an interview and I was, it was my turn. I was the person. And they said, uh, and I learned that lesson that the markets are always right. They may not be right in, in a duration period, but I don't, but I don't have that. I, you know, if you're, again, if you're right at the wrong time, you're wrong as a trader, as an investor, you may, you may sit through it, but not as a trader because the, the losses will pile up so dramatically that you'll get crushed. And, and as I would, and when I would teach people, I'd say, look, it, capital is your inventory. So if you're Macy's and you don't have inventories, you can't open the doors tomorrow. And tomorrow may have been the day everybody wanted what you previously had, but you're in liquidation, getting rid of it. It's the same with your capital. If you had a great idea, but you, you were stubborn and stuff, now all of a sudden you get blown out. And of course the rule of thumb is then the next day, you know what happens. Oh, I was right. I was right. You don't ever want to be put in that position. So preserve your capital, pay attention. So I've learned, I've had to relearn that lesson at times. And yet the guy who brought me into business, my mentor, Lenny Feldman, was the greatest teacher of loss taking. And that's really, he taught me so much how to manage losses and manage your capital. Because that's ultimately what it's about as a trader. It's something that you have to get away from as a floor trader. Because, and it's here coming back to my mentor, who uh, unfortunately passed away in 2015 at the age, but at a good old age of 89. And he had a great, a great, who would tell you he had a great life. He'd call me, he'd be on dialysis and we'd be talking about markets. And I go, Len, what are you doing? And he was trying to trade the old way. He'd call in his orders, but with the algos and stuff, he was always getting stopped out because they don't care about 10 point stops. The, the markets just don't operate that way. And the old time traders, they would buy them and they'd set their stop. And if it went, then they would be adding to their position. And I said, you can't trade like that. You, you've got to put, change the way you trade, put in your orders below the market, wait for the market and then go. But he couldn't adjust to that, you know, because his style is, hey, if the momentum is going your way, it's like he would say, if you're bullish, you can never buy a buy them high enough. And if you're bearish, you can never sell them low enough, which was that mentality. Me, I become very patient. I put in orders like on tomorrow's unemployment numbers. I'll have orders way away from the market, but I've learned that I'll get filled eight out of 10 times at levels that are my level rather than trying to chase or pursue the market. The worst one I had was in 1979 in the gold because I was going on vacation. And I had told people, I'm checking the trades. I'm going on vacation and I'm not going to be here. So I want to check around. So I had a $10,000 out trade that I had to split. That was really my worst uh, 
out trade uh, that I can remember. I may have had worse, uh, you know, but I've always maintained that they probably wash anyway. You have some good ones, you have some bad ones. So, um, and I was pretty cautious. Uh, that's no guarantee. With the banks, the worst was on the phones when you think you're both, bu- when the bank says, no, I'm a buyer. And you go, no, no, we were buying. And I have the sell, you know, so I had those, but usually my reputation with the banks was, you know, so even if the tapes weren't clear about it, a lot of times the banks would resolve it your way because we had a lot of business to do and they were, there was nothing that big. There was nothing, and, you know, they can absorb it far bigger than I could. And I was the one who was, you know, bringing them the accessibility. So uh, great, I, you know, you'd get there uh, because again, so much of my work was preparation. So I would look forward to it because openings were critical, you know, because they would kind of set the tone and you would see, but the currency markets, the openings really weren't that significant because they're trading 24 hours a day anyway. I was much more interested in the grain openings to see certain things off, especially when they were news driven and to see how the markets react. You know, is it, you know, you learn, is that already in the market? Is it totally in the market? Uh, and, and you learn about that and you not to be sucked in into, uh, you know, as they say, buy, buy the news, buy the rumor and sell the, sell the news. So I, I love the openings, uh, a lot of energy, a lot of energy. Go work out. So I'd go over to the East Bank Club. When the weather was nice, I'd bring my running stuff and I'd go to the lakefront and I would run the lake and, you know, and I'd say, okay, I'll take a break. And they all, and the lakefront was great because I could stop at the phones along the lake and just call in to see, you know, what was going on. I, to me, it didn't matter. I didn't care where I stood. It made no difference because, and that's why sometimes I get pissed at people because I said, hey, I turned the market, but you're not close enough or you're not convenient enough is really what you're saying. I didn't do that because I would bounce around all the time. I was always, I might be doing Deutschmark yen spreads. I might be, I was always spreading because I was looking for, in the way that my matrix worked, uh, relative value trades. So I didn't have a spot per se. I, and, and, I, and that was fine for me because I understand the guys wanted it. They wanted that spot. You know, there was a big order for it. That's where the flow was. He was willing to take, he or she were willing to take, but I, I didn't need, because I, and I, and I wasn't going to do that because it was not, it wasn't right. Took care of them because I understood that you need the locals because when, 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 when things get hectic and you want them, you know, I used to argue with the order fillers who would only hit, like, especially in the currency markets, the dealers. I go, you're making a mistake. You know, that's for your convenience, but you're going to lose a lot of volume in the pit because a local, it's almost like vol- velocity of money. That's how I would explain to them because a local will turn a trade four or five times. If you hit the dealers because it's your convenience or then it got to be a point where Order fillers were pissed at the locals because the locals didn't want dual trading. So they were freezing the locals out. I go, you're, you're killing yourself because if you lose the locals, you're going to lose all the business because the dealers don't care where they do the business. It's going to drain all that out of there. You're, you're stupid by not hitting the locals. So I would try, especially the, the locals who I thought were really good market makers, always, always hitting them. That's not to say... I wouldn't hit the dealers because I was a dealer too when I was doing currency iron, but I was fair. You know, I, everybody would get some. You know, that's such a gray area, what we call legal practices, you know, because I remember when they set up that ethics committee after the FBI investigation and, and I went to the first one and they asked a question. If you're standing on the top step or the, the second step and you see an order hand signaled in, can you trade off of it? And my attitude was, yeah. Because once, if you're not putting it, we, we, went, we went to a lot of extremes to, to give the dealer community uh, access to the pits, which was good for everybody. But by doing that, they didn't put in written orders, which was an advantage. So by signaling it in, does that become public information? And, that, you know, it was a serious issue. And you know, people thought I was making a joke, but I wasn't. I said, well, you know, I can argue ethically, but my, my first priority is putting bread on the table for my family. And I'm not stealing from anybody. That's when, when is a hand signal into the pit, not public information? You know, it becomes a serious issue. Um, yeah, there were all, you know, listen, uh, 
I saw guys get trades, you know, who there were definitely better bids. But when, you know, and you understand when there's pandemonium, and there was pandemonium how many times, and the order fillers are running huge responsibility because if there's an uptick, you're going to be held to the uptick, right? Unless you have a DRT order. But if you're, so they're doing their best to protect themselves while trying to give the customers the best order. I think the Chicago pits were, were on very solid ground. We, uh, I, I remember I was, I was at the FIA convention with my friend, uh, I was walking around with Mike Sturge and we were, we were just killing time. It was over at the apparel mart. There were, the tables were set up as you, I'm sure you would see them. And here was the CFTC and here was the COMEX. And I said, they're booths. And I said, hey, come here to both of them. I said, I think you guys need to meet each other because I trade a lot there and you're not governed by the same rules. <laughs> Search is pulling me away. He goes, don't start. I said, I, I can't help it. So many, I can't begin to tell you. People who helped other people out. I watched a guy who came down with brain cancer and I saw guys pass the hat one day because it was real, the guy was, it was just not going to be good. And they probably collected in cash twenty or thirty thousand dollars in a hat, you know, that he could take home because who knew what you know, and there was a guy, yeah, I'm sure he had savings, but I I come at Christmas time, the, the taking care of the floor personnel, poning up money for the pit report. I, I saw things, charity, some of the most charitable people, Mike Sturge, who I'm talking about. The, the Sun Times wrote him up last year, Santa Mike at St. Vincent de Paul, 52 years. He's been taking care of the kids and seniors. And it's one of the things I'm proud of. I was, because Mike said to me, I said, Mike, I don't do it for that reason. He says, no, no, you're going to be, when they had the man of the year, you're the first man of the year. He says, it's a Catholic charity. You're a Jewish kid. What better thing? And I've known Mike and his brothers were from the same area and had played ball with his brother, Pat, for for years and his brother Bill, you know, and, and he said, no, this is for your kids. It's not for you. And I talked to Mike yesterday and we are still very close. Uh, I write a blog. So last year I've never taken a dime. I write the blog and, and I've never asked anybody for anything. But last year, Mike had told me that St. Vincent Paul, the food pantry at Misericordia was empty. They were having middle-class and upper middle-class people who were really getting hurt coming for food. So I put a notice in the blog. I said, hey, these are people who are really in need. This was last May and, and June, I believe. And we raised $100,000 all anonymously. People who sent in money. Uh, and I felt pretty good about that because, and I said, Mike, we should have done better. He says, do you know how much money that is? Do you know how, much, how many food trucks, trailer trucks full of food of staples this is going to put in? He says, you have no idea. He says, this is phenomenal. So you know, and that's the floor. That everything really that your parents tell you about keeping a good name, you know, my that was stressed to me. My mother was a big believer in that. She says, don't be fooled by wealth and things. All you take to the grave is a good name and keep your name. And that has served me well. I, I could look at, at pictures of my mother. And I said, mom, you're a hundred percent right. Because people treat you with, with a lot of respect. I still, I get calls from people, uh, and, and you build friendships off of it. And that is a life lesson I tried to teach my kids. And people say, well, why you work so hard at keeping the exchange, you know, with the rules? I said, because I'd like my kids to be able to come down here if they so desire. I want this place, their reputation. Their reputation is everything. And, I, and I'll tell you something else, John. One of the great things that I'm most proud of, I'm the only floor trader to ever sit on a CFTC oversight committee. You know, Leo Mohammed, he said, your reputation is impeccable. So uh, Wendy Graham to uh, Sheila Bear, who I'm still friends with she, when she was CFTC commissioner, to Brooksley Bourne. So I sat on that. I'm the only local floor trader ever to sit on the uh, Financial Products Advisory Committee, which was an oversight. And gives me a lot of pride because it tells me that everything that I worked for really was realized. And I had their, their respect. I said, you're right to regulate the over-the-counter derivative market. I said, and I'm telling you, it's in my best interest. I'm representing exchange, the seats, and there was, we weren't public entities. And you know, we're talking 97, 98, but you're hundred percent right. And she said, well, I'm, I'm going to go do that. I said, but they're going to beat the hell out of you. And they did. they did. But 
you know, it was, it was a nice friendship to develop. So those are things I'm really, really proud of. The board trade used to make me nuts because when we had the, when we were starting with Goldbex, they had tried the night session, which was, Leo covers that really well in, in his new book, but then they went to the Aurora system. Uh, being on the Colbeck uh, screen design, and really, which was basically what, so we're probably 1990. This was after the FBI investigation. So now they're trying to promote the Aurora system. We're called to a meeting. At the, so the five of us on the screen design, we met with them. And I started laughing in the meeting because they had your icon. So they would have JLN. And the order filler was free just to trade with you. I said, this is an electronic bag man. Because I said, this is preposterous. So we sat in a meeting for about three hours. So we're walking back to the CME and Scott Gordon. Oh, he, Scott was on the committee and he wasn't chairman yet. So we, but he was, he was the chairman of the screen design. And so he says to me, he says, that's your last joint meeting. I said, because I was just laughing. So I said, I don't care. I, I really, I don't care. This was preposterous. This system is a joke. This is what we're trying to get away from. John Lothian News would like to thank those individuals who have contributed to our Markets for Key Education GoFundMe campaign. Their financial assistance allows us to produce and distribute videos like this for our Open Outcry Traders History Project or the Path to Electronic Trading video series. Join them in supporting John Lothian News, capturing the history of our industry.